My name is Christian uh, from Heinrich Böll Foundation, and I'm simply the host. Yeah, and it's a big honor now for the second time to welcome you at Heinrich Böll Foundation. Who knows what this foundation is? Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, I go for a 50 50 count and we'll use two sentences uh, just to say who we are. We're the foundation of the German Green Party, and as you might know, there's the first big connection to this event. Uh, the German Green Party was born basically out of two big campaigns in the 70s and 80s. This was the famous peace movement and this was the atomic energy movement. Yes, these are like the two campaigns out of which the Green Party evolved and as well the Heinrich Böll Foundation. So basically today, uh, what is this about? Campaigns, can they change the world? Can they make the world a happier place? I believe yes, just coming from Estonia, where I was uh, a witness to a wonderful campaign by a theater. There was elections last week, and on the last second, a theater which had produced a musical about the main candidate of the almost fascist party in Estonia, combined with a digital poster campaign, succeeded in turning the elections around. So I deeply believe campaigns can change the world. Um, well, and maybe let me point out before I pass over to the real stars of that event um, that we are really proud uh, that we have put one campaign forward called the Meat Atlas, yes, you find it downstairs, which we have combined also with, let's say, some digital edge, so if you find some time in the next two days, just take a look at our little Meat Atlas, all right. And now I pass on to the organizers to first Judith Orland from Oxfam, responsible with her team for the wonderful program of the next two days. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Yeah, we switch so a bit between English and Deutsch and here. We make now the greetings in Deutsch. Um, die zwei Keynotes sind dann auf Englisch und äh, es gibt auch ein paar Workshops auf Englisch, aber wir sprechen auch relativ viel Deutsch hier. Ähm, genau, ich bin Judith Orland von Oxfam, ähm, eine der Mitorganisatorinnen von der Recampaign. Ich bin Maike Jansen von WICWAM, äh, ebenfalls Mitorganisatorin und ähm, ja, wir freuen uns ganz, ganz doll, äh, hier zum zweiten Mal sein zu können. Äh, lieber Chris, ja, liebe Böll Stiftung, äh, wir genießen sehr, dass hier alles extrem gut eingespielt ist und irgendwie auf derselben Welle äh, mit uns groovt sozusagen äh, und haben hier eine neue Heimat gefunden, so fühlt es sich an und schön, dass ihr auch hierher gefunden habt zum zweiten Mal. Herzlich willkommen nochmal. Genau und ähm da wären wir auch schon bei der Frage, wie oft, wer war schon wie oft auf der Recampaign? Vielleicht einmal eine Hand hoch, wer, für wen ist das die erste Recampaign? Uh, wir freuen uns immer, dass es immer wieder neue Leute gibt, das ist toll. Für wen ist es die zweite? Aha, auch schon einige. Für wen ist es die dritte? Okay. Die vierte? Oh, da gibt es auch schon äh, genau ein paar. Die fünfte vielleicht? Wow. <lacht> wir haben einen, yay, der ist schon zum fünften Mal dabei, ist toll. Genau, wir sind dieses Mal hier zum sechsten Mal dabei. Ich würde, mich würde auch nochmal interessieren, wer äh, kommt nicht aus Berlin? Ah, auch sehr schön. Ja, also wir müssen viele, viele Dinge erklären. <lacht> Und wer ähm, kommt nicht aus Deutschland? Das heißt also, aus, äh, genau. And who, who is not, yeah, <laughs> who doesn't come from Germany, so who doesn't speak uh, German? Uh, some people who, who came from, <laughs> from far abroad, yeah, thank you for coming. Okay, genau, um, wie ihr seht, also einerseits uh, unsere Konferenz, es geht ganz viel um, um euch vor allen Dingen und um, ums Vernetzen und uh, unser typischer Anfang und den machen wir jedes Jahr, weil wir den einfach auch sehr schön finden und auch einfach gut ähm, zum Vernetzen ist, dass ihr jetzt die Gelegenheit habt, zwei Minuten ähm, euren Nachbarn kennenzulernen. Ähm, bitte, äh, wenn ihr den schon kennt, einfach äh, umdrehen und den Hintermann kennenlernen oder die Vorderfrau, wie auch immer. Ähm, auf jeden Fall zwei Minuten habt ihr Zeit, äh, euch einfach mal kurz vorzustellen, warum seid ihr hier, was wollt ihr, was erwartet ihr? Ich 
Aber weil das immer so... Okay, so langsam zum Ende kommen, ganz langsam äh, euren letzten Satz beenden. Ihr habt später noch genügend Gelegenheit, euch weiter zu vernetzen und weiter kennenzulernen. Ganz langsam zum Ende kommen. Sehr schön. Super. Genau, jetzt habt ihr so einen kleinen, äh, euch schon mal ein bisschen kennengelernt. Wir stellen uns jetzt auch noch mal als Macher ganz kurz vor. Ich bin Judith Orland von Oxfam. Oxfam ist eine internationale Hilfsorganisation, ähm, sehr global vernetzt und deshalb, äh, und wir machen auch sehr viele Kampagnen. Das ist uns auch sehr wichtig, sozusagen die Politik zu beeinflussen. Und deshalb haben wir eben vor sechs Jahren auch gedacht, ah, mit diesem ganzen Online-Kram macht das äh, einfach auch Sinn, hier noch mal die deutsche Szene auch mehr zu vernetzen. Und ähm, genau, haben die Recampagne ins Leben gerufen. Ich war bei der Gründung noch nicht dabei, ähm, wie gesagt, jetzt die sechste Ausgabe schon. Ähm, damals war für Nest, so hießen wir, als WIC war früher noch ähm, ausschlaggebend, auch genau diesen Austausch und äh, das gemeinsame Lernen zu ermöglichen. Ähm, mittlerweile ist das immer noch ein totales Herzensanliegen und ähm, eigentlich noch wichtiger geworden. Äh, wir sind mittlerweile eine ähm, Kommunikationsberatung und Agentur von 25 Leuten und wir merken halt sowohl, im Team als auch ähm, in der Zusammenarbeit mit einigen von euch ähm, und mit vielen, die noch da draußen irgendwo zu denken sind. Ähm, es kommt so viel darauf an, bei guter Kommunikation auch ein gutes Team zu haben, eine gute Stimmung zu haben. Und ähm, beides soll hier zusammenkommen, miteinander lernen, viel guter qualitativer Input, aber eben auch hier, ihr müsst das Ganze ähm, verarbeiten, ihr wollt miteinander reden und ähm, dann überlegen, wie ihr das umsetzen könnt. Und für alle diese Dinge ist hier hoffentlich der Raum. Genau, der Dritte im Bunde, der die, so ähm, die Recampaign auch mitorganisiert und von Anfang an mitgetragen hat, ist die Social Bar. Ähm, das ist, deren Motto ist ähm, Online vernetzen, offline bewegen. Und mittlerweile gibt es auch mehrere Social Bars in verschiedenen Städten in Deutschland, wo sich lokal Leute einfach vernetzen und treffen und auch genau über Kampagnen und digitales, sozial-digitales sich austauschen. Ähm, dazu gibt es auch noch draußen Informationen. Genau, also so viel erstmal zu uns als den Veranstaltern der Recampaign. Diese Veranstaltung wäre nicht möglich ohne sehr viele Partner. Und deshalb wollen wir denen jetzt ein bisschen die Ehre erweisen. 
Ähm, ich habe sie mir aufgeschrieben, damit ich niemanden vergesse. Dieses Jahr wurden wir großzügig unterstützt von Campact, die hier auch mit 15 Leuten vertreten sind. Winkt doch mal. <lacht> Wo seid ihr? Hallo Campact. <lacht> Ähm, Engagement global äh, könnt ihr treffen ähm, und ähm, die, ja, denen habt ihr es zu verdanken, dass ihr hier ähm, nicht nur Konferenzprogramm habt, sondern auch ein Spiel genießen dürft äh, mit vier Stationen und äh, der Registrierung hier direkt am Infopoint. Ähm, das hosten die sozusagen und äh, sind auch zu bestimmten Zeiten äh, ansprechbar. Die gebe ich nachher nochmal durch, weil ihr euch die jetzt glaube ich nicht äh, merken könnt. So, dann ähm, gibt es Amnesty International. Ähm, die haben euch einen Ruheraum hier zur Verfügung gestellt, sozusagen. Ähm, auch da könnt ihr interaktiv mit einem NFC-Game etwas erleben, was ihr dann im Raum sehen könnt. Und ähm, ja, gute Entspannung mit Amnesty International. <lacht> das Motto lautet, wie war es? Es ist besser, eine Kerze anzuzünden, als die Dunkelheit zu verfluchen. Also es hat natürlich einen ernsten Hintergrund, aber ihr dürft es auch genießen. Ähm, dann ist Open Petition ähm, auch mit am Start bei unseren Partnern. Wo seid ihr? Hi, <lacht> auch euch vielen Dank. Ähm, Advocate Europe ähm, ist in letzter Sekunde noch auf uns zugekommen und wollte uns unterstützen. Wir sind dazu immer bereit, auch für alle <lacht> Das geht. Und das Campaign Bootcamp hatte vorgestern schon eine tolle sozusagen Vorveranstaltung zu die Campaign, die thematisch schon perfekt passte. Und hier werden sie ähm, euch mit Bier ähm, beglücken. Heute Abend. Genau, das waren unsere Partner und dann gibt es natürlich auch Leute, die wir brauchen, damit ihr alle erfahrt, dass wir wieder Recampaign ist. Und das sind die Medienpartner. Genau, da danken wir natürlich auch unseren Medienpartnern, der, die Taz, die schon ein langjähriger Partner ist, Fundraiser Magazin, Politik und Kommunikation, Reset, dieses Mal zum ersten Mal dabei die Digital Media Women, da fanden wir, freuen wir uns sehr, äh, Le Monde Diplomatique, die haben auch ein ähm, Leserexemplar von ihrer Zeitung auslegen, ähm, Enter, das Enter Magazin und die Stiftung und Sponsoring. Und in diesem Jahr ganz besonders äh, der Freitag, ähm, da haben wir eine Sonderausgabe, eine extra Beilage gemacht, ähm, gemeinsam mit dem Freitag ähm, zum Thema Campaigning und Zivilgesellschaft. Ähm, das liegt auch ähm, draußen aus, falls ihr das ähm, nicht äh, mitbekommen habt. Genau, auf jeden Fall allen Medienpartnern vielen, vielen Dank. Ähm, jo. Stifter Helfen hat uns auch in diesem Jahr wieder mit viel Kommunikation ebenfalls unterstützt, auch wenn es keine Zeitung ist oder so. Und äh, mit Green Campus haben wir also die Weiterbildungsakademie von Böll, da ist heute auch die Barbara, glaube ich, im Saal irgendwo, ich sehe dich gerade nicht. Ähm, wir haben zum ersten Mal eine Recampaign-Werkstatt veranstaltet, gestern, ähm, um alle Praxisthemen, die hier immer wiederkehren, mal auszulagern in eine, wirkliche, ähm, ja, in eine wirkliche Trainingsatmosphäre, wo man sich nicht blöd vorkommen muss, wenn man nochmal fragt, wie das mit den Hashtags nochmal war. Ähm, ich, wir sind noch gespannt, euer Feedback zu hören von dem Tag, alle, die da waren. Und ähm, freuen uns auch über diese Kooperation. Vielen Dank. So, jetzt aber zum Inhalt, oder? Ein bisschen. Gut. Also einerseits, was hat uns dieses Jahr bewegt? Genau, dazu müssen wir hier eine PowerPoint starten. Gar nicht so leicht. Handzeichen. <lacht> so. Was hat uns bewegt? Wir denken ähm, natürlich immer vor allem in Hashtags. Dieses hier kann man schlecht aussprechen, ALS, Ice Bucket Challenge. Ähm, warum hat uns das bewegt? Ähm, ehrlich gesagt, bei WIC waren vor allem deswegen, weil seit es die Ice Bucket Challenge, äh, Challenge gab, ähm, alle auf uns zukommen und sagen, wir wollen sowas machen wie die Ice Bucket Challenge. Gar nicht so leicht, ehrlich gesagt. So ein bisschen wie, äh, wir wollen unser eigenes Facebook nachbauen. Das war vor fünf Jahren der Fall. Ähm, wir sehen hier Bill Gates, wie er wahnsinnig Spaß hat, bei dieser Challenge mitzumachen. Und ähm, ja, meine Gedanken dazu sind zweierlei. Äh, erstens, ganz schön schwierig, das Ganze wirklich zu skalieren, also eine Aktion sich jetzt auszudenken, äh, die genauso groß wird, obwohl sie von der organisierten Zivilgesellschaft kommt und nicht von irgendeinem lustigen Privatmenschen, der, ähm, der allein dadurch mehr Sympathien sammelt. Und zweitens auch ganz schön schwierig zu skalieren, weil was wir hier sehen, ist eben auch ein sehr amerikanisches Phänomen, mal wieder. Und äh, vielleicht 
regt euch das auch noch mal zum Nachdenken an, zu überlegen, ähm, wen fänden wir da jetzt eigentlich cool zu sehen? Ja? Also ich habe mal überlegt, wäre das jetzt cool, wenn Angela Merkel mitgemacht hätte? Ich weiß es nicht. Ähm, oder brauchen wir einfach ein eigenes Hashtag und einen eigenen, eine eigene Aktion? Ähm, dann wäre hier auch der Ort, sich eine zu überlegen. Okay, und natürlich hat uns äh, Anfang des Jahres ähm, sehr stark ähm, die Ereignisse in Paris bewegt. Ähm, Je suis Charlie. Dieser Hashtag ist ja dann sehr, sehr schnell ähm, um die Welt gegangen und ähm, ist auch einer der meisten ver verbreitetesten äh, Hashtags gewesen. Ähm, interessant finde ich daran, dass er sich auch dazu dann geeignet hat, äh, Je suis Ahmed, Je suis Bardot, jetzt äh, gerade von den Anschlägen in Tunesien. Es hat sich sozusagen daraus auch nochmal was weiterentwickelt. Ähm, Genau, auch das ähm, hat uns dieses Jahr bewegt. Genau, und äh, eine andere Sache, ähm, Save the Children hat äh, zum dritten Jahrestag des Syrienkrieges äh, letztes Jahr ein ähm, Video ähm, gemacht, das sage und schreibe, ich bin eine NGO, ähm, 46, äh, 46 Millionen Mal angeklickt wurde und angeschaut wurde. Die ähm, Agentur dahinter war Don't Panic aus äh, Großbritannien. Ähm, ich weiß nicht, ich nehme... Ich frage mal vielleicht, hat jeder dieses Video gesehen oder kennen die meisten dieses Video? Nicken, schütteln, wie auch immer. Lohnt sich auf jeden Fall anzugucken. Es ähm, ist sehr, recht schockierend. Ähm, es geht, was daran interessant war, war einfach diese Benutzung, dieses auch wieder so einer Internet-Meme von einer Sekunde aus dem Leben und daraus eine Story zu bauen, ähm, was dann sehr funktioniert hat. Hat aber auch zu sehr vielen Kontroversen und Diskussionen geführt, ähm, wie wir jetzt als NGOs überhaupt solche Themen aufgreifen und ob das Video jetzt äh, gut ist oder nicht und so weiter. So, und wie gerne hätten wir jetzt Jan Böhmermann hier bei uns auf der Bühne stehen? Er konnte nicht, er hat zu tun. Ähm, ja, ähm, das letzte Hashtag, Varufake, ähm, großartige Mediensatire. Ich äh, denke, das haben alle mitbekommen. Äh, wenn nicht, schaut euch äh, gerne, also guckt unbedingt nochmal. Es gibt so viel lustiges Material im Netz, unter anderem dieses GIF, äh, wo äh, angeblich zu sehen ist, wie äh, Janis Varoufakis die ganze Zeit nur so macht, im Dauerloop. Man kann sich von der Echtheit selbst überzeugen oder auch nicht. Ähm, Großartig finde ich die Aktion deshalb, weil wir nochmal sehen, einerseits äh, das Internet ist so ein riesiges Echo Chamber geworden, ein, ein Raum, wo sich äh, Reaktionen irgendwie, ähm, ja, äh, wo die kumulieren, wo sich ähm, einfach immer mehr Empörung anhäufen kann und, und irgendwann explodiert. Alle reden drüber, niemand weiß mehr Bescheid und genau diese Mechanismen ähm, kann man sich anscheinend mittlerweile sehr schlau zu eigen machen und einfach mal die News hacken. Ähm, ja. Kein weiterer Kommentar. Genau, und daraus ergeben sich eigentlich so für uns ähm, drei Hauptfragen. Also wir haben jetzt keine drei Hauptthemen für das äh, Programm entwickelt. Und viele dieser Sachen, die wir hier gerade angesprochen haben, kommen auch gar nicht im Programm an sich vor. Also wir haben jetzt keinen Vortrag zur Eisbacke Challenge und auch natürlich auf der Kürze der Zeit auch nicht zu äh, Varu Fake. Aber ähm, wir haben sozusagen drei Fragen, die wir euch gerne mitgeben möchten. Das eine ist, wirklich angesichts dem, des Erfolgs der, des islamischen Staats, vor allen Dingen in sozialen Medien, angesichts der Tatsache, dass Algorithmen, gerade bei Facebook und bei Google, zunehmend bestimmen, was wir sehen überhaupt. Und eben auch nochmal angesichts der Tatsache, dass es oft auch gar nicht so einfach ist, in Medienzeitalter zu sagen, was ist Fake und was ist Original. Genau, wie positionieren wir uns zu diesen Netzfunktionen für ihn? Das, darüber würden wir auch gerne mit euch diskutieren wollen. Ähm, einige der Workshops eignen sich dafür und bestimmt auch ganz viele Coffee Breaks und ähm, ähm, das Barcamp. Das ist die erste Frage, die wir euch gerne mitgeben möchten. Die zweite Frage ist, hatte Maike auch schon mal angesprochen, ähm, genau, wie können wir skalieren? Also einerseits von ähm, klein auf groß, aber natürlich auch von groß auf klein. Also wie ähm, können wir als Zivilgesellschaft gute Beispiele, die wir haben, äh, in beide Richtungen skalieren? Und als allerletzte Frage... Genau. Ähm, welche Formen und welche Möglichkeiten bietet das Netz überhaupt der Zusammenarbeit? Also hier ist Collaboration, aber auch Crowdsourcing, wozu wir ja auch einen Workshop haben. Ähm, und äh, Crowdsourcing und ich hatte noch eine Sache, die mir jetzt gerade entfallen ist. Genau, auf jeden Fall. Collaboration und Crowdsourcing sind hier die beiden Stichworte und ähm, darüber würden wir auch gerne mit euch ein bisschen mehr diskutieren. So, jetzt aber erstmal genug des Inhalts. Jetzt gibt es noch ein paar Regieanweisungen, bevor es dann auch gleich wirklich ganz losgeht. Genau, die Regie sagt an. 
Ähm, wir sind live im Netz vertreten auf unseren verschiedenen Kanälen, vor allem auf Twitter natürlich als das schnellste Medium, aber auch auf Flickr. Ähm, auf Script findet ihr unsere Präsentation, also die der Sprecher, diese hier nicht, <lacht> äh, in Kürze. Und alle, die mit twittern wollen, nutzt wie gewohnt das Hashtag RC, diesmal mit einer 15 dahinter. Ähm, wir hatten Konkurrenz aus China. Ich habe gehört, wir haben das mittlerweile äh, hinter uns gelassen und diesen Hashtag zurückerobert. Ähm, aber wenn ihr chinesische Tweets findet zu RC15, das sind nicht wir, soweit wir wissen. Ähm, WLAN ist hier vorhanden, habt ihr wahrscheinlich auch schon gemerkt. Das heißt einfach Freifunk und ihr braucht kein Passwort. Fertig. Ähm, dann ähm, könnt ihr jederzeit natürlich bei Fragen und Problemen äh, auf unser Team zukommen. Die sind weiß gekleidet, haben bunte Fliegen und bunte Sticker. Ihr könnt sie also nicht übersehen. Einige stehen da hinten, falls ihr Ansichtsexemplare mal sehen wollt. <lacht> genau. Ähm, und dann ähm, wollen wir noch sagen, gleich geht's los mit den Keynotes. Zwei hintereinander im Programm steht eine Viertelstunde Pause. Wir versuchen die aber zu verkürzen, das ist also eine kurze Umbaupause, ihr müsst nicht zwingend den Raum verlassen, bleibt lieber hier und nehmt im Anschluss aber bitte alle, alle Sachen mit, weil dann hier umgebaut wird. Also alle Taschen, die ihr dabei habt, bitte dann einmal mit aus dem Saal rausnehmen. Genau, ähm, was noch wichtig ist, seid immer pünktlich in den Sessions, ähm, denn es könnte voll werden und ähm, ja, wir können den Raum dann nicht größer machen, als er ist. Und ähm, nach der zweiten Kino treffen wir uns dann zum Mittagessen. Anderthalb Stunden ist Mittagspause. Und ja, da ähm, hoffen wir, dass ihr genauso viel Freude habt wie im offiziellen Programm, äh, weil ihr euch da vernetzen könnt. Ihr könnt das Spiel spielen ähm, und viele andere schöne Dinge miteinander bequatschen, denke ich. Gut. Und dann gibt es noch zwei ähm, Programmänderungen, die ich ankündigen möchte. Ähm, leider hatte uns Carsten Berg abgesagt, das ist derjenige, der zu der Europäischen Bürgerinitiative arbeitet, aber er hat netterweise Ersatz geschickt ähm, und zwar auch eine sehr kompetente Frau, die genau auch zu diesem Thema arbeitet. Also Heike Agete wird äh, sozusagen den Workshop von Carsten Berg übernehmen, auch zum gleichen Thema Bürgerinitiative, Europäische Bürgerinitiative. Ähm, da sind wir also sehr froh drum, dass wir da im Thema bleiben konnten und ähm, genau kompetente ähm, Frau finden konnten. Sehr schön. Die andere ähm, Programmänderung, äh, da konnten wir leider nicht äh, im Thema bleiben. Ähm, das bezieht sich auf die erste, äh, den ersten Workshop, der hier in dem großen Saal stattfindet, Mobilizing Strategies von Jennifer Dempsey. Ähm, wir wollten eigentlich gerne was zur Schottland-Kampagne hier machen, weil wir das äh, super spannend fanden, wie die mobilisiert haben und online und offline verknüpft haben. Leider hat die uns krankheitsbedingt abgesagt. Hm. Genau, und aus ihrem Team und so weiter konnte auch keiner kommen. Gut, äh, dann haben wir uns überlegt, okay, ähm, aber eigentlich beschäftigt uns ja auch sehr stark dieses Thema, was wir so ein bisschen unter Evil Campaigning äh, bezeichnen. Also wieso und wie kommt es, dass ähm, islamischer Staat oder die Rechten und so weiter so erfolgreich sein können im Netz und wie positionieren wir uns dazu und ähm, haben jemanden gefunden, der uns dazu was sagen kann und erzählen kann. freuen uns sehr darüber, ähm, Arne Vogelsang wird das machen, ähm, das ist ein Performance-Künstler, der sich halt gerade vor allen Dingen ganz viel mit Netzphänomenen auseinandersetzt und ähm, zuletzt auch ähm, sehr viel mit diesem ganzen ähm, radikaleren politischen Szene auseinandergesetzt hat. Genau. Dessen Workshop heißt Feindbeobachtung, Best Practice Beispiele extremistischer Kampagnenarbeit. Also der wird sozusagen hier dann stattfinden. Wir sagen das auch nochmal an ähm, und im po Online im Programm ist es auf jeden Fall auch schon aktualisiert und wenn ihr ähm, uns per Twitter folgt, dann gibt es da auch nochmal Ans Ansagen zu. Na, also vertraut den ähm, Displays, die hier überall äh, in den Fluren hängen, die TFT-Screens. Da ist das Programm aktualisiert und auch ähm, auf den Aufstellern vor den Räumen findet ihr das angepasste Programm. Okay, but now finally I switch to English. And it's my pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker, Amy Sample Ward. Amy is the CEO of the network. N exactly, I thought <laughs> I mixed up the ends. The Nonprofit Technology Network, um, which is a membership based organization uh, based in the US. They look at how technology can improve and have an impact on social change. She's an author. She has written two books. Uh, one is called 
social by social, if I'm not mistaken, and the other one is um, social change everywhere, anytime, or anytime, everywhere, whatever. Social change is her topic, and uh, she's going to talk about that. Um, yeah, Amy, the floor is yours. After her, uh, her presentation, there will be uh, time for questions and answers, and so, yeah, I give the floor to you. Good morning. No? <laughs> it's like 2.30 in the morning where I'm from, so thank you. Yeah, awesome. Um, okay, so I'm going to speak in English only. <laughs> and if I speak too quickly, everyone's going to do this. Can we practice? OK, so this means slow it down. Uh, I think I have only until 11.15. So if I'm taking too long, we'll do this. <laughs> practice, everyone. OK, this means speed it up. And if you just want to say hi anytime, you do this. <laughs> practice, yay. OK, and if you have a question, I thought, OK, you've all had coffee. It is not 2.30 in the morning where you are from. Raise your hand. Uh, and there are microphones and a volunteer. Who is a volunteer? Judith will bring the microphone to you. You don't even have to do anything. Just raise your hand. OK? So I'm Amy. Hello. I'm the CEO at N10, the Nonprofit Technology Network. Who has heard of N10 before? Yay! Are you N10 members? Yay! <laughs> the rest of you are invited to join anytime. Uh, so most of what N10 does is totally free and accessible, and uh, membership helps us understand who is in the community so that we can better create resources or educational programs for you. Um, so please join, be a part of it, give us feedback. Um, and I want to start by making all of you take a test. Does that sound great? Everyone super excited to take a test? Yes, good. Okay. Um, so I've pulled some questions out of our annual research, the tech staffing and investment survey. So these are questions to help you understand, not you personally. Um, I didn't want to show up and judge all of you. Uh, instead, it's about your organization. So we can all collectively judge our organizations. Sound good? OK. Um, so we're just only going to do two pieces, hopefully not too difficult, about your technology adoption level and your effectiveness level. So to get started, so you're going to need um, something to write on or mental math, whichever you prefer. I prefer writing it down, just putting that out there. Uh, but it's not difficult. So it's just a few questions, and you're going to rank your answers, OK? So it's going to be a question. And then on a scale of 1 to 5, and I'll keep the scale up on the screen so that you can uh, remember or see. Can everyone see? Yes? OK. So one is strongly disagree, up to five strongly agree. So you pick one, two, three, four, five uh, for each question. So good so far? OK. Diving in. Question one. Are you ready? Here we go. This is exciting. We're taking a test. We're going to judge our organizations. It's thrilling. No better way to start our day. Yes. I appreciate the cheers. OK. Question one. We have the technology we need to do our work effectively. So this is not you personally. You are not having to go to therapy right now and talk about yourself. You are here rating your organization, OK? And I'm going to keep it moving. So if you have not already given yourself a score, I am just talking slowly to buy you time before I change the slide. Ready? Question two, OK, same scale, one to five. We have enough skilled staff to support the technology needs for our organization. You have enough skilled staff. <laughs> yes, skilled is key. I heard that. <laughs> OK, ready? Your gut reaction is best. I'm just going to keep it moving forward. OK. Question three, we have enough training for all staff to use technology effectively. 
it's getting quieter each question as people are getting sad and sad. <laughs> Okay, ready? Next, we make effective use of technology to support our programmatic work. So direct programs or services with your community, you're using technology effectively for that. Okay, same question, different topic. We use, we, we make effective use of technology for fundraising. Now it gets really sad. <laughs> okay, last question. We make effective use of technology for communications. Okay, so now take your six numbers. You should have six numbers from each of the six, one from each of the six questions, and you're gonna add it up. So you have one total score. Now the mental math is coming in. <laughs> okay, wasn't that fun? I'll tell you the answer in a second. So now is the second uh, question, okay? So what we were just looking at there was effectiveness. Now we're gonna look at adoption. Uh, in this, there is no math. Now you're just going to listen and reflect. Uh, so there's, I'm gonna share four um, statements and you're gonna pick the statement that, again, is not about you, it's not always about you, this is about your organization. Which of these statements is most aligned with your organization? So type one is we're struggling. We have a failing infrastructure and our technology time and our technology budget generally go towards creating workarounds or band-aids, repairing equipment, and we duplicate tasks. It's okay, it is okay. We're going to talk through it today, if this is you. <laughs> it's better to admit so that we can start to process. Okay, type two. We keep the lights on. We have basic systems in place to meet our immediate needs. Leadership makes technology decisions based on efficiencies with very little input from staff. Now it's silence because everyone's like actually picking this one. I see it in your eyes. Okay, type three, we keep up. We have stable infrastructure and a set of technology policies and practices. Leadership makes technology decisions based on standard levels according to industry or sector information like N10 research and gathers input from staff before making final decisions. And the last, type four, we're innovators. We recognize that technology is an investment in our mission and leadership integrates technology decisions with organizational strategy. Tech responsible staff are involved in overall strategic planning, helping to craft the future of the organization and plan how we use technology throughout. Okay, now we have to reconcile our own answers with the research. So uh, who, when you, looking at those one, two, three, or four, who picked uh, three, type three organization? It's okay if you did not pick type three, okay? So we find in our research about half of the organizations self-identify as type three, which we consider operating. Uh, how, many were, how many were below operating, type one or type two? Okay. And who in here thinks you're a leading organization? All right. People with your hands up, you had better be up here presenting. Um, <laughs> you are apparently the innovators that we should all be learning from. So, any of those people who raise their hands in sessions later, we're calling on you. I will call on you in English. Uh, everyone else can call on you in German and I won't know if you're actually a leader. Um, <laughs> so here's how that looks when we separate it out by the size of an organization. And in this report specifically, we do size as budget size because some organizations have very dramatically different staff related to their budget size, so we use budget as a general uh, guide. And what I think is important to notice is that small organizations, so ones we would consider with um, 
less than a million dollars, uh, which is most organizations, have more leading organizations than the large organizations, ones with a very large budget, uh, which is important to know because we don't need to feel like if only we had more money, we would be better. That it actually doesn't correlate just having more money, it's how you use that money and where you invest it. Okay, so now for the, the numbers that you added up, how many, when you added up your six numbers, you came out with 18 or less? Okay, you are all getting a D as a grade score, which would be failing in the US, <laughs> which is okay. We are here to deal with that and go forward. Uh, and the important thing is the way we separate those questions so that you can try and see where you have the most need to improve. Uh, so what we see regularly when we administer uh, these two scales is that people say they actually have the tools. They have the software, they have the hardware, the equipment is in place. They don't have the training to use those tools to make the most impact. So if you're trying to look at your budget, see what money you have and how best to use it, don't necessarily try to allocate even more for more technology. Instead, you need to invest in having more training to use the technology you have so that every single staff person across every single department can really be using it uh, for whichever campaigns, whichever goals they have in their team. And here is uh, the same where we're looking at both the um, adoption level and the effectiveness score. Uh, what's I think important to note is the right side, where you can see leading organizations have a much higher average uh, tech effectiveness score on each of those uh, six questions. Questions yet? Did I start by a downbeat? Silence. Okay, it'll get better. I promise it will get better. Uh, so I'm going to quickly show, since I think I have now 20 minutes, um, what we've seen in our research, what those leading organizations do. So not just the four people who raised their hand in the room as leading organizations, but in the research, what are the characteristics of leading organizations so that we can try and learn uh, from their example. So first is staffing. And something that we've seen uh, over the last just couple years as a big increase is the number of organizations who specifically uh, note data as part of a staff person's role or even an entire staff title um, focused on data. Because if you, in our campaigns, even in our day-to-day -day program work, we are creating a lot of data. And if we do not have the time explicitly in our job to evaluate that and learn from it, Again, we're not going to be making the most effective decisions on the tools that we choose or how we put those to use. Um, so that's been really promising for us and interesting to watch change in the community um, difference in the survey year to year is that uptick in data staff. People always want to know about money, so I included a slide about the budget. Um, and what I think is interesting, so in this graph, this is not necessarily saying this is the total amount spent. This is the amount spent per staff person, uh, and this is for everything. So again, recognizing as an organization how you are investing per staff in your uh, actual tools, in the hardware, in the software, but also importantly in training. It can't just be your first week on the job, you're told what everything is, you're given a long list of usernames and passwords, but ultimately are you every week coming together as a staff and saying, hey, I found a new way to run this report in the database, or here's a new way that we can be uh, using an online fundraising tool. Whatever that is, you're creating regular opportunities for training. Um, how many folks here have a strategic plan at your organization? Okay, not every hand. Um, <laughs> maybe we could start there. Uh, <laughs> But one thing that we've consistently seen with leading organizations is that leading organizations understand how to put technology directly into their strategic plan. If you're creating this very high level plan that says this is how you believe change needs to happen and how your organization is going to get there and it's what you're telling funders and foundations, it's what you're telling your individual donors, it's what you're telling your staff and, and all of your volunteers and none of it talks about technology, when you come back to all of those groups and you say, great, and here's the tool we're gonna use, it, 
it's not going to make any sense. The justification isn't there because you haven't been able to articulate yourself in your own strategy, which tools you need, which kinds of data you're going to need, what you're going to need to invest in to make that change happen. So leading organizations are able to make that articulation. They can say, here's the change that needs to happen in the world. Here's how our organization is going to get us there. And here are the tools we need to make it actually happen. Uh, and here it is by effectiveness score as well. So some of these are beautifully simple graphs, uh, which we like at N10 because the answer is very clear. Uh, so leadership voice is really important to us. I think it's more difficult um, for some organizations than others because every nonprofit is a beautiful snowflake that is totally unique and could never have anything in common with anyone else. Uh, so in the nonprofit sector, we reinforce that by making up ridiculous job titles that have nothing to do with anything but make us feel like we're beautiful snowflakes. So um, sometimes this is very difficult for us kind of arbitrarily to judge, uh, but, but in this research when we were um, asking organizations to identify not their job title but their role in the organization, leadership would mean um, you're part of the team that is making the strategic plan, not necessarily that you are the executive director or something. Um, so in that leadership team, uh, and it's important to us that someone on that team or all of the people on that team are making decisions about technology, that you don't have a leadership team completely creating strategies absent from the understanding of which tools it's going to take to make that happen, especially if those tools or trainings are not already in the organization. Uh, and again, pretty, pretty easy to read that leading organizations uh, do that far more than other organizations. And then by effectiveness score, which is, again, beautifully easy, uh, no, no room to misinterpret that graph. So specifically looking at training investment, budgeting to, to train staff, um, how many folks in here have a training budget? Some? Maybe less than half? OK. How many people have in your organization, have you been trained beyond your first week on the job? OK. About half. We're getting there, slowly but surely. Uh, so leading organizations definitely do that more than any other organization. Um, they distribute that training across all teams and look at how that training can happen in a responsive way. So as you're working, what is it that you need? Um, do you ha did your database just get an update? Great, every single staff person should be trained on that, um, not just assumed that they will happen upon the new way that reports run as they're trying to use it. Um, so making sure that that's part of standard staff meetings or um, professional development budgets aren't just uh, new skills outside of the job, but also directly the tools that they're using. And again, by effectiveness score. So overall, when it comes to budgeting, um, this is something that I think is um, really difficult in organizations because everyone has does budgeting differently, but also the idea of budgeting for these tools um, can, can make some organizations feel, like we talked about at the beginning, that it's just about having more money, when ultimately it's about how you use that money. And the only way that you can make decisions about how best to use the money is that you have completely separated it from, from other things. So we see all the time organizations don't have a, a way in their budget to say this is how much we spent on technology because buying a computer, buying software, paying for an online account, all of that gets marked in with like paper towels and pencils and pens and anything else that you buy in the organization. So, you know, you're not making the best decisions when at the end of the year you look at your budget and you think, oh, we spent this much money, but maybe a lot of that was coffee and it wasn't necessarily software updates. Uh, so unless you separate that out, you can't be making a very uh, informed decision about how to use that. So again, here it is by um, tech adoption level. So this is the green isn't, this isn't a yes or no, but the green is that you actually have a separate account line item just for technology. 
Um, blue is that you have some of it, but it's still probably a, an aggregate of m multiple purchases. And then yellow is that it's in your miscellaneous fund with your paper towels and your coffee uh, and your pens. And by effectiveness score, I think this is uh, most interesting. OK, how many folks in here act annually run a return on investment evaluation of your tools? OK, a few. As I keep my hand up, more people just raise their hand in solidarity. That's great. Uh, <laughs> So this is, um, this is something that we have seen grow over time. When we first started asking this question, very few organizations in any category said that they did this. Uh, and over time, it's becoming more common. Um, of course, most common in the leading category. But I think as organizations feel this um, pressure or opportunity to use some of the same language about their work that maybe for-profit organizations use, ROI becomes more of um, an attractive model because it lets them speak kind of this business language uh, and evaluate our, our work. So here's what that looks like against the adoption level. And you can see, compared to all those other categories, this is still very small. Um, so gray is that you just every once in a while do it, whereas green is that it is part of your, your process. Um, and, and orange is no. So even in the leading category, it's still pretty small, um, but again, it's growing over time. And against the effectiveness score, again, it's not, um, it's not huge. OK, so that was a lot about technology. And also, I have very little time left. So, and people should be doing, what's that slow down? This is speed up. So I'm going to speed up. And I know also that Angela is going to talk about community. but. When we're done talking about tools, um, which I kind of consider that beginning part, talking about how we invest in our tools, um, outside of that, I mean, our tools are just things that exist. They will not be running campaigns. They will not be changing the world. They are just hammers. And they require humans to actually come use those hammers to build a house or, I guess, whatever else you are planning to build. I prefer houses. Uh, so, so we also have to think about how we invest in people. And I think often we think that means hiring people. Investing in, in our people means we have to hire people. But ultimately, I think it means we have to invest in our community. Um, we can't run a campaign by ourselves alone on the internet as just the staff that we have hired, especially when you know staff have multiple jobs. Not everyone on staff is supposed to just be clicking like on your Facebook page. So how do we invest in that community? First, I want to define what community means, because I see these words, community and network, interchanged all the time, and they mean different things. Uh, and if we can be clear about those definitions, then we can be clear about what our goals are. Uh, and I think also the last one out there that I'll explain is crowd, which everyone wants to jump straight to that. Everyone wants to have a ALS ice bucket challenge. Everyone wants to have this viral video. Uh, and that's not actually the way the internet works. So in the side, if everyone can see, on the side it says your organization. You can think of that however you want. Define it how you want. It can be your organization. I like to think about it that way because I think that campaigns are specific moments in time. But overall, our work has to be consistent and long term. So I use this to think about the organization as a whole. But if you want to think about it for yourself as one program or one campaign, one service, I cannot stop you from redefining this however you want. Um, so that first ring, so the, the closest ring to your organization, the only one touching your organization, is your community. So what defines your community is that those are people who have opted in to you. They have given you their email address, or their phone number, or their address, or they have followed you on Twitter, or followed you on Instagram, whatever it is. There's a direct connection. Uh, that's really important because it means a few things. First, it means there's nothing stopping you from communicating with them beyond like the Facebook algorithm and things like that. There is technically nothing stopping you. you. They have already opted in. They've clicked subscribe in whatever way. Uh, and that also means there's nothing stopping them from talking to you. And I think a lot of us forget that, especially when it's outside of campaign time, that all of those people are still there. They are still connected to us on email or 
Twitter or whatever, and there's plenty of opportunity to continue letting them talk to you and inviting that input. And lastly, by opting in, by, by clicking subscribe, by following you, they have said, I'm interested in what you're doing. I believe in your mission. I, you know, I, I'm eating the dog food. Um, I see a lot of organizations, though, whether it's on social media or it's in their emails, in their newsletters, in their campaign messages, over and over selling people on the mission, reinforcing why this is important. Stop wasting all those communications. They know. That's why they subscribed. They already believe you. So stop convincing them to believe you and give them something to do. That is what the community wants. They've already said, I like you. I'm buying in. So give me something to do because I like you. Uh, don't try to convince them. It's just a waste of your communications. And over time, it makes people, whether they're activists or donors or both, they're going to start feeling like you are not paying attention. You do not know who they are because you've already taken an action. You've already donated. And yet you're just convincing them to do it over and over. OK? So then our next ring out, that's the network. And again, I hear these words, community and network, used all the time, but they're different. Your organization cannot touch the network directly. That ring is solid between the community and the network. The network are all of the friends and family members and coworkers and grandmas and whatever of your community. Whoever your community is, these are their people. The way you get to them is when you share something with the community, whether it's an email, it's a Facebook post, it's whatever, you share content with the community that's so relevant to them, they want to share it. It's meaningful to them that they want to share it. It's a call to action that they want others to take. So when you want to reach the network, instead, you shouldn't be thinking about who are these people, what do they like. Go to the people you know, your community. You already know what they like, or you should know if you're paying attention. And give them what they like, what's relevant to them, the kinds of actions that they are ready to take, and let them spread it to the network. And then the last ring, oh, oh the crowd, the viralness of the rest of the world's population on the internet. Um, again, you also don't just touch that. Uh, the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge wasn't created by someone uh, posting a video that a bunch of strangers started sharing and participating in. Those campaigns are started because they are so relevant and so shareable in the community that the community has shared them with all of their community members, and it gets all the way out to people who are totally unconnected from the organization. So even though it wasn't started, ALS Ice Bucket Challenge in this example, um, and I know I'm only using this because I saw it earlier, but everything was in German, so I don't know what you were saying about the campaign, so maybe this isn't a good way to use this example, but anyway, you already brought it up. Um, so in that example, you know, the organization, like staff did not create that campaign, but a longtime volunteer who was part of that community of the organization started it. And all of his friends, actual staff at the organization, everybody started sharing it until it went all the way out into the crowd. So again, we can't be thinking that our next video is just going to be picked up by everyone. Instead, we need to think about what we can put in our video, who we can put in our video that's part of the community, that has a story that's relevant to our community, and that has actions that those community members are ready to take. I feel passionate about community. But I know Angela's going to talk about it, so I don't want to spoil all of that. Uh, so a few quick things, because I have only five minutes. So how do you really know that your community is there? First, is your community online? How many people say every single person in your community is online? OK. I am surprised about that, unless your mission is to only work with people who already have the internet. <laughs> Turns out there are a few people in our worlds uh, who are not online. Uh, and I think that often in organizations, because we are communicating with people online, it feels like, well, those are our people. They're there. Um, but they may not necessarily be there all the time or regularly or in a very effective way. 
So we asked, um, this is just an example from some N10 research, we asked people how their constituents most often get online. Um, and what I think is really surprising is these bottom two where we've got about 65 to 68% say they're at home via mobile or at home by a computer. Well, that does not add up to 100, that's too many. Um, and the idea, if you're choosing both of those, someone who's at home on a, on a phone is not having the same experience as someone who's on a computer. Uh, and the next highest rank thing is at a public library. Okay, so if my access point is at a public library, I'm probably not just leisurely strolling through my Facebook feed and looking at random campaign videos online. I probably have only 20 minutes and I'm just checking my email and sending something off. You know, so if that's someone's normal access point, what they can do with you when, in, when they have only 20 minutes is probably not read a really long email newsletter. They probably have a very short amount of time. Um, Judith, there's a question right here. Can we take a microphone? Oh. Sure. Okay. Done. Yeah. There you go. You're lucky. <laughs> it's stupid and simple. That's, that's a U.S. survey. Or is it um, world, Europe? This was not limited to the US, this survey. All right, so it's... So anyone could have taken this survey. And the survey is also still open. I just took this out of SurveyMonkey last night. All right, so it's <laughs> more or less global survey. Yes. All right, okay. Sure. Okay. More super simple questions like that. <laughs> uh, so next, once we start asking our community members where they are and how they're getting online so that we can better understand how much time they may have to get our content and to take an action about it, we need to start asking them what skills they have. What are they ready to do? Um, are they able to sign up for your email newsletter because that's about the extent of their internet skills? And we're then just assuming that everyone that gets our newsletter is a online activist ready to take all these actions? Or did they sign up because really that's it? And they are going to need very clear instructions if you send them an email on how to participate in the campaigns you're creating. Uh, and then depending, of course, on just what campaigns you're working on or the kind of theory of change you have, are you also educating them on how to be safe and secure in participating in activism online? Um, so this is also from that same survey that is live and I just took screenshots of the current results. Uh, and so these are, there are four questions, so I'll go to the next slide too. Um, but barriers, people say, um, and what's important to notice is that top one that's the biggest is I don't know. So this means we are not asking our community members who are trying to participate with us in our work and in reaching our mission, we don't know what barriers they're facing. So how can we plan against that and give them what they need so that they can participate if we're not figuring out where their barriers are? Um, so first is if they have an internet connection or not. The highest answer is I don't know. Well, in question one, you seem to know and you decided that they were at home. Um, but clearly, we aren't really asking and we're making a lot of assumptions about who our community members are and how they're getting online. Um, the next is that is the, is the barrier that they don't have computer equipment. Again, we don't know. <laughs> and then the, the last two, um, is their internet mobile only? Which is, of course, gonna dramatically change which tools they're using for how long and, and when and where. Um, again, we don't know. And that the next highest is that it's not a barrier, which I th think is surprising. Uh, and then the last is lack of training. And this, for the first time, we see that it is a significant issue and that it's a significant barrier. Both are, are creeping up, the bottom two bars there. So again, lack of training about how to actually do this work. What can we do to share our knowledge as campaigners, as people who work on the internet regularly? How do we share that in very usable pieces every time we're communicating with our members so that when we ask them to take action, they're ready to do it? Um, which is my last point, how ready are they to take an action versus how ready are you as an organization to launch a campaign? Have your community members already been 
told, or do they have easy access on your website to language that they could use if they were to talk about your organization? Um, have you already articulated not just why you do this work as an organization, but specifically prepped them on the issues that are coming up so that when you launch a campaign, they're aware of that political change or they know about that law, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, and if, have you encouraged your community members to share their personal story? Because if it isn't anchored in their own experience, it's just going to feel like a Facebook share. It's not gonna feel like actually creating a community of activists and advocates uh, on your behalf. So here's just two. I think there's many, many great resources out there. Um, but I really like these two resources because not only do they talk about how to be an online activist or how to create content, they specifically include information about how to be secure and safe. Uh, if you're creating live video from a protest and police are involved, knowing how to remove geotags and post that video anonymously can be the difference between going to jail or not. Uh, and so helping your community members understand how, how they can use these tools safely and what their rights are um, can, can make a huge difference in people feeling like they can participate. Uh, and here's another one um, similarly that includes many different um, security and communications pieces from World Pulse. Uh, so I'm already at time, but I wanna quickly just put up two, two summation slides um, because lots of people are tweeting and so I wrote things very shortly uh, if you want to try and tweet. So investing in success internally inside of your organization of course means figuring out what the right tools are for your staff, training them all year, not just when you have something new or when they start at the organization, and to be regularly evaluating what's working. That means ROI uh, or, or other evaluation metrics on your tools, but then also evaluation against specific communications against certain channels uh, and different types of content. And then, outside of your organization, investing in your community so that they are part of your success. Um, same, as, same as your organization. Make sure you're using the right tools for those people. Uh, if, you, if you do go ask and everyone is on a mobile phone, is your website mobile friendly? Are you using uh, apps in your campaign that can be accessed on a mobile phone, et cetera? Um, offer direct training. If you know that you're gonna have a campaign launch next month and you're really gonna want a lot of involvement from your community members, hold a free day training so that people who are interested and have already you know, opted in, have already bought your mission, can come learn from you in just a few hours how to be the best advocates for your mission. Uh, and then of course, create real feedback opportunities. If you're not talking to your community members and learning from them, then you're just gonna keep you know, getting more and more siloed having campaigns that only your staff are participating in. You have to invite the community into your work. So that's it, and it's already 11.15, exactly. <laughs> Questions? If you have a question, Judith can bring you the microphone. Exactly. Thank you, Amy. Thank yeah. you a lot. And yeah. I do invite everybody to pose their questions. Where are the hands? No questions. Oh, my God. Amy. I've solved it all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, over here. Ah, okay. People just need a little time. Okay, we'll take that first. Thank you very much for the insights in your survey. And I'm a bit curious, is, did you um, see any correlations between the area the organization was engaged in and their technology fitness or readiness? No, it's really interesting. We, we normally divide organizations in our surveys between, I'm gonna get it wrong now, six categories. So animal welfare, environment, international, human service, education, oh, it was so good, and one more. Um, <laughs> and normally there's examples at every level, every effectiveness, you know, across all those types. Um, we also do another survey that I didn't talk about in here, but when I sit down, I'll, I'll tweet the links. The research is all free. You can download it whenever. So I'll, um, I'll share out some links, but there's also a report that we do 
on benchmarks that's specific to email and online fundraising, so um, open rates by type, and it, there, that's where we see more difference. Um, people opening both advocacy, like there's a direct action, um, as well as general kind of what we would consider like a newsletter update, you know, just general information communications um, with, of course, like animal welfare organizations have higher rates because we are all suckers on the internet for like puppies and kitties and baby alligators and things. And so we, you know, those organizations just get so many opens. Um, and international organizations, of course, have huge swings year to year because um, if there is, say, a tsunami, uh, those organizations have this you know, huge spike in open rates and um, click-throughs and donations, and then the next year it looks like it looks like they've tanked or something. But it's because the year before was such a high increase from from a storm or natural disaster. Um, so that's where we see more difference. But when it comes to tech adoption, we see it in examples across the board. Yeah. Okay. There were two questions. Okay. Here. Hello. Um, Hi. I just wanted to know for the study. The leading organizations, they had to subjectively identify themselves as leading. Yes. So in this, um, in the tech investment report, it's a survey response. In the other report that I was talking about, the benchmarks report with email open rates and fundraising, um, that's not a survey. We get access to organizations' database and we run those algorithms ourselves. Yeah. And the next question. Okay. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. That was very interesting. Um, I just yes. wondered <laughs> if you could just uh, say a couple of words about your organization, like in sum up what you sure. do when you don't hand out surveys. Sure. <laughs> so N10, the Nonprofit Technology Network, we are a nonprofit ourselves, and we believe that every nonprofit, regardless of where you are based or how many staff you have or what your budget is, that you're going to need to use technology effectively to actually meet your mission. We would like the world changed, and we would like it changed a lot faster than it's currently being changed. Uh, and the only way we can do that is if we're using technology effectively um, to really you know, create change at scale. So there are only 11 staff. Uh, we will not fix your website for you, but we will explain and teach you what responsive websites mean, what accessibility for the web means, um, how to find a web developer that can create a website meeting those needs. Um, so, so we're focused at the strategic level, um, even though I wish I could fix all of your websites. I just do not have the time. Yeah. Hi. Hi. I'd like to come back to um, that one slide. You don't have to pull it up. No. Um, <laughs> where, you, where you said most, most campaigners don't know um, what their community would like or why mm. are they not responding or why they are responding. Mm. So, so the next logical thing to do would be a survey among followers and, and the community, ask right? Ask them. Yeah, mm -hmm. ask them. Now, um, I, I've often um, seen within organizations that are reluctant to do service among followers because uh, they say, well, there are so many people who do not read our emails anyway and who click them away and you know, don't click through. Um, we don't want to put them off with a survey, especially since... Um, the people who will take the survey are the ones who are still opening at all our emails, and you know the others who are not opening our emails will but not take the survey oh anyway. So, so we, not, we will not find out. Just a second. <laughs> we will not, we'll not find out why they don't like us. So, uh, what's your take on that? Oh, I have so many takes on that. Um, so, if you have a bunch of people who receive your emails and they never open them or read them, does it matter? Like, if they're not opening or reading, remove them from your list. I mean, you're paying like a penny per person, right, in theory. Get rid of them. Or send them a message once a year that says, like, puppy face, yay, you open this message, here's your dog or something, you know. Uh, <laughs> that's your reward, you know, value first. <laughs> um, you haven't read any of our messages. If you want to stay on our list, click this button. Otherwise, we're removing you and move on. Get rid of, get rid of it, you know, the flotsam. <laughs> um, a, 
and I'm happy to talk to anyone about how to do that in a positive uh, way that feels like it's aligned with your organization's values, but get rid of those people because they're not helping you reach your mission. Um, I'd rather have 10 people on my list that open every email than 10,000 that have never opened any because what's the point in messaging them just so I can say I have 10,000 email addresses? Like, I don't, I mean, no, they're not taking action and that's what I want, right? I would like the world changed, not emails sent. Ah, I'm not making friends. <laughs> um, and I also think, I, I get that a, like a long survey or even a short survey that you have to open an email and click through to a survey is not necessarily appealing, but I have had the opportunity to meet organizations and people in so many different countries, and one thing that I have found to be consistent about humans is that we are filled with opinions and all we want to do is share them. So if you as an organization give your community members this great gift of sharing their opinions with you, <laughs> uh, you're creating real engagement. They just said, this is what I like, so give it to me. And then when you do, you can say, hey, you asked for this puppy in your email and we gave it to you, so you better damn like it. You know, here it is, your puppy. Um, not necessarily, I prefer puppies over kittens, obviously. Um, I keep coming back to that example. Um, but I think there are lots of ways you can get that information. Lots of passive ways, too, that people will still give you that information. If you have a sign-up page, like, you know, get on our newsletter. I think uh, a good example I normally look at because they change it all the time is um, NWF, National Wildlife Federation. So on their site, of course, all that's required is your email address and your zip code. For most organizations, that's all you need so that you can target, in, you know, campaigns or appeals or information based on the region where someone lives and their email address to send it to them. But they have additional fields that aren't required that say, what things are you interested in? It's NWF, so they have like gardening, bird watching, wolves, like whatever their things are so that they can say, hey, no one has signed up for gardening in a year. Maybe that's not a thing in our community anymore. Like maybe people that are associated with NWF don't associate themselves necessarily with the environment, but with this specific like species that they want to be an advocate for. And that can help them change their communications and better understand. So doesn't just have to be a survey where you ask people. It can be all these other passive ways you collect information. I could talk about this for a very long time. There's a question over here. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there's a question over here. And we have time for one more question. Okay. So just um, last question, quick show of hands. No? Okay, so here. we'll take yours. Okay. Um, how would the perfect... Uh, oh, okay, sorry. Um, when uh, social organization and uh, technology organization work together, how would they perfectly cooperate in your view? What, how should they come together? Uh, I guess in my view they would not be separate organizations. But that all nonprofits, all, all nonprofits should consider themselves a social justice organization and a technology organization. Because if you don't see your work and your mission to change the world as part of creating a just world, then I might argue that you should uh, realign your efforts somewhere else or better understand who your community is that needs your work. And I think all of those organizations, regardless of who you are or where you work or who you're working with, need some type of technology to get there. Uh, again, that is going to be very different depending on the community that you're working for, but if that's not integrated into how you operate as an organization, you're not training your own staff, we can't rely on having you know, our five staff and then three consultants that manage our website and write our newsletter and do all of that separate because they're not living and breathing our mission the way our staff are, and if our staff aren't trained to do to do those things and to manage those tools and to make the decisions about the tools that we're using for our community, we're going to get technology further and further away from the people we're serving, which is going to get us into a place where we're not actually serving them. I feel like from your face that was not the answer that you wanted. <laughs> well, but you're going to stay on for a little while, so yeah. I'm sure um, everybody who doesn't feel like asking a public question or anything, Amy is around so you can approach her. I would like to give you a, a thank you a lot. Yeah.
Thank you for having me. Yeah. Yeah.